So this happened when I was around 9 years old. I'm 25 now, and it's something I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I lived in a terraced house, four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area with several of these terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood, so seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was nine, I usually got home from school at about an hour before my mom got home from work. I lived maybe 50 meters away from my school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. This one day, I got home from school. I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double-check that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was nine. Being alone was a little scary, even though it was in the middle of the day and only for one hour. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do my homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio with a view to the road I told you about before. It was kind of like the sound of a cat. But my cat has been missing for over three months. Hope sparked and I thought, OMG, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There was a guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high-pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomp cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen, observing this, eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react. He kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the doors and called my mom who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life. Laying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises coming from the guy eating cigarette butts from the ashtray on my patio. I kind of blacked out for a moment, because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we'll come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds were more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and out of my field of view. The police jumped the fence and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female officer with full force and he knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup and an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else, because he just looked at me and said, I sure hope you didn't see all that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive wondering what was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around 5 kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mother. 
The police had to remove him from the house that time five years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in the body because of the autism, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure that this would never happen again, and he promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I looked at him and gave him a nod, and then I hear the high-pitched noises. It's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing, and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again, because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was nine, I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. Sixteen years later and he was back to look for his mother. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did that police officer. He didn't. He smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. He went inside. His face lit up. Pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mother. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived ten minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later, and we made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday, from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. Now, for several years, my thoughts were, let's not meet guy on the patio eating from the ashtray, and now my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons. My new friend, Tom. This happened about 19 years ago. I was nearly 13 years old and I was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a little tourist town in Florida. They had had problems with their two daughters as adults my mother being the older of the two, and they wanted to do everything they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her stuff together. We were all very close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. They raised her too, after all. So being as she was my only aunt... She made sure that the time we spent together was always super cool. I would stay over Saturday nights. We would go out and hang out at the pier and she would let me go hang out with my middle school boyfriend who would find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea of any of these activities of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a younger female figure since my mom wasn't around. One night, when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy and they really hit it off. He was very nice and introduced himself to me. He went by JR and at first was kind and a charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out for a while and then we went home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more and my aunt had really liked JR. He took her to his home and introduced her to his father and showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I have lived in this town for 30 years and I still to this day couldn't tell you where it is. I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot and it surprising her. He had these weird flamenco dancing clothes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless. I mean everyone has their quirks. 
About ten days, maybe two weeks later, we were again at the pier out by the payphones, talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner. JR and my aunt were in their late twenties, early thirties, and as much as she loved me, I imagine these were times that I got in the way. Well, anyway, we were at the pier and he is talking about how he has these painkillers. He offered me one. I declined, of course, and told him I had a high tolerance to pain anyways and didn't need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asked me if he can see for himself, assuring me he won't really hurt me, he's just trying to have fun. This idiot twists my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry, and he laughs and says, Oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I was stronger than I thought I was, being... I'm sorry. No need to ruin the good time we're all having. I go in the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying. My aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's messed up too and that she talked to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks her what she is up to that night. She tells him that she isn't sure if I am staying over because with what had just happened. I was whining about going home. I was angry that she didn't deck him right there for hurting me. Well, he tells her that she should meet him under, let's call it, the Sunset Bridge at 2am on the other side of town. He says that the stars are beautiful and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her he would love to see it with her and they can dance under the moon. We were all from a fishing family and live in a fishing town, so fish activities under the bridge at late times wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be people there hogging all of the fish. She tells him maybe and we leave. I decide to spend the night, after all, later sneaking in only if she will pick up my boyfriend Charlie, playing up on guilt points I was. She calls him when she gets home, before we made her arrangement about Charlie, and says that she can come, but she will have me with her. He groans and is like, Fine, alright, I guess she can come too. Maybe she'll get tired and sleep in the car. About an hour after she called JR the first time, I asked her about Charlie and she agrees. She sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face lovingly, apologizing for what had happened with my arm. My aunt was an amazing woman and I love her very much. She then calls him again and tells him not to worry. She's picking up Charlie, so I will have my own entertainment and they can have their time. He goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now, and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her, not a family reunion, I guess. He went on about how he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He hangs up after calling her some crazy names. She bewilderingly hangs up the phone and tells me what had happened. We go about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation and things are fine. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks, but my aunt was having none of it. After a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he had came. The whole affair lasted only a month, if even that. Three weeks maybe, and all in all, it wasn't the craziest experience she had had with a man. JR was soon forgotten and we went about our business. Flash forward two years later, I am almost out of middle school. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I still lived with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around the rules. One day, my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding a bit. She had this big beautiful red truck and I would ride around in the cab of it, loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing, listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up the Taco Bell drive through We cruised down the road a bit before heading back to Frank and I's separate houses. He lived just down the road. We had a lot of fun that day. She dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle and even more so when they saw that I had gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain because she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my parents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. They said how lucky I was that she had just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our parents, eh? That was the last time we ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days. 
I can't speak for everyone, but I assume she had just ran away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a hot new girlfriend and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind. I figured she got tired of her parents acting like infants and took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. Sixteen is a whole different life than fourteen, especially when you are in different schools. I wished her well, maybe even a little envious that she got out of this town and I was still here. I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her when, at about nine at night, my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found out in the woods. She had been strangled to death and just left out there. I don't even know for how long. I was devastated. I was so joyful that I had the last experience with her, but so saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. It was a very sad time for our town. The good and bad news is that they caught the guy that had done it. He confessed after some very incriminating evidence and during his questioning also confessed to ending the life of his girlfriend who had been missing for about eight years and also his father, staging his death to make it look like he did it himself. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen staring back at me, was a picture of J.R. I had no idea they even knew each other. I can't even imagine what would have happened if we had gone under the bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back. I was shocked to see it on the TV. The memories came rushing back and I decided to write them all down. I literally have a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to losing it. My aunt lived on to make awesome new memories with me. I have a beautiful life with my husband and three boys that most likely wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. I was 10 years old when we moved into a new apartment. It was a bad neighborhood. My mom, who was 8 months pregnant at the time, had no choice in the matter. We had just been released from a domestic violence shelter and turning down a cheap house wasn't an option, no matter if it was in the ghetto or not. Our first and last day of living there follows. After we were dropped off, we claimed our bedrooms, even though we had nothing but a few garbage bags of clothes. Not a single piece of furniture, even a bed. I claimed the upstairs because it was a cool idea to have two floors. I imagined running down the stairs to catch the school bus. My eight-year-old brother chose the room next to mine. My five-year-old sister was sharing a room with our mom downstairs. It was right beside the front door. After our excitement wore down, we had to walk to the grocery store since we didn't have food either. While I was reading the magazines, I casually saw a cell phone that had been left on the racks. At the time, 2001, few people had them. Definitely not people like us. I picked it up and found my mom. I showed her with my face, shocked. She immediately put it in her purse. I became angry at her. I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. We should tell the manager of the store or wait by the magazines and see if someone comes back to find it. Nope. Mom told me to hush and continue to shop. She wasn't a thief. I never saw her steal anything before then. I was still a little mad at her when we arrived back at our new home. We all obviously started taking turns with the phone playing the classic game Snake. When it came time to sleep, we literally piled all of our clothes on my mom's floor. It was the only thing we could use for a bed. Us kids were goofing around on our pallet and mom was in the living room. That's when we heard the banging on the door. Someone was screaming to let them in the house. A male voice, an unknown voice, banging and kicking on the door, screaming out threats to let him in or he'll do terrible things. Mom grabbed the phone and immediately dialed 911. After she told them the address and information she urgently said before hanging up, Hurry! or we'll all die. She ran us to the bedroom and told us to hide in the closet and she slammed the door behind her. Of course, me being ten, I immediately opened it back enough to peep through to see what was about to happen. I didn't see my mom. 
The kicking and banging kept getting faster and louder. He was shouting, I know someone's in here. Open up this door. Mom came out of the bathroom, holding the toilet tank lid above her head. She stood by the entrance of the door, waiting for him to eventually break in. Her face was frozen in the most serious expression. She was focused, holding this object almost like a tennis racket. She didn't move at all, ready to do something she probably never imagined she'd do. Attack a stranger, and maybe even worse. She never said a word back to him or us. I saw their lights before I heard them. The man was still cursing while the police subdued him. He sounded different though, disappointed, defeated. The cops then opened up our door. I think he had just finished breaking in enough to come inside. My mom was still holding the tank lid in her warrior tennis stance. The cop calmly took it away from my mom and said, It's okay, we got him. Within two seconds she burst into tears and fell to her knees crying and thanking them. After we all hugged and calmed down a little, a cop who offered to stay and patrol until sunrise told my mom something in confidence. She shared with me years later that the stranger was a registered offender with previous burglary charges as well. The next morning, we got picked up by a family friend. We ended up staying with her until we found a safer place to live, right before my mom gave birth to my brother. I don't know why he picked our apartment or why he tried so hard to get in. I'm just glad that my mom stole that phone that day. It was turned off the next day, but we still used it occasionally to play snake. I'm a 32-year-old female and this is something that happened to me only two nights ago. My husband, Kevin, and I were on the porch smoking a cigarette. It was about 9 o'clock at night. We live far out in the woods, right off of a stretch of highway that's between two interstate exits. We were looking up at the stars, enjoying the quiet atmosphere of the crickets, glad to have a temporary relief from all of the usual traffic noise. I heard something and shushed my husband, even though he hadn't said anything. Was that screaming? Yes. It was a woman screaming like nothing I had ever heard before. It sounded like she was getting murdered. In between blood-chilling screams, she was calling out, Help me. Help me. I look at my husband. We were both really freaked out. The more she screamed, the closer she was getting to the house. I could eventually see a figure running along the median of the highway, making their way closer to the part of the highway that was in front of our house. Our house is a good ways back from our driveway, but not far enough that you can't see anything. If we could see her, that meant that she could see us. We have no yard security lights, stupid I know, so we were in complete darkness. We could still see the highway perfectly fine due to the house across from us who still had their Christmas lights up. I threw my sig in my yard and back up to stand in the doorway of the house, pulling out my phone to call 911. She's still in the median of the road, screaming. If anyone else in the surrounding houses heard her, they pretended like they didn't. Kevin runs past me inside to get on his jacket and shoes. I tell him not to go out there, but he ignores me and gets dressed anyway. As soon as he is out of sight, I see a red car barrel up the road and pull over next to where the lady was at. With her in the median, there was still a stretch of highway between them. There was a man driving. I couldn't see what he looked like. I only heard his voice. He was yelling that he was going to hurt this woman, calling her terrible names. It looked like he was throwing stuff at her out the window, maybe clothes. As soon as she sees him pull up, she starts running straight towards our yard. By that time, I was already on the phone with the police officers, but as I said, I live out in the woods, pretty far out of town, I'll add, so it would take them a bit to get there. I yell for my husband. I tell my nine-year-old to go in our room where the baby is and close the door. He can hear the whole thing and was pretty frightened. My husband runs out onto the porch and into the yard towards her. He asks if she's okay and she says that she had gotten a ride home from this guy and halfway down the road he started acting really creepy. He refused to let her out where she told him and kept driving with her in the car. She looked behind her seat, pretending to look at a car behind them and saw a roll of duct tape. 
Fearing for her life, she jumped out of the moving car and just started running down the road, screaming for help. Kevin starts to lead her towards the house, but now is also on the phone calling the police, having gathered more information that I wasn't able to give them when I had called. They told him to stay on the line with them, until an officer showed up. He lets her in the house and her face looks terrible. She is red and bleeding in a couple of spots, road rash from where she had jumped out. She also said that he had hit her before she was able to escape. She came in and we locked our door, knob, deadbolt, and chain. We stood together near the window waiting for the police to show up, Kevin giving updates and answering questions on the phone. No, they haven't gotten here yet. Yes, his car is still parked across the highway. It's a red sedan in front of the house with lots of blue porch Christmas lights, he told them. I was trying not to lose my cool when there was a loud bang on our door. The man was yelling. I know you're in there. I saw you running. The people in there can't protect you. I shouted through the door that he needed to leave our property and, if he was smart, get in his car and drive off. I told him we were on the phone with the police. The answer he gave was the worst one I could have ever heard. He says, Go ahead. Call the police. I don't care. They won't be here in time. Bang, bang, bang on the door over and over. The woman was freaking out and crying, saying, Help me. Please help me over and over again. I ran to the kitchen to get a large knife just in case. We had a huge solid iron door, but our windows were easily breakable. If he wanted to get in badly enough, he certainly could. My husband just came from our bedroom with his gun when a squad car pulled up in the yard. Two more following behind it and one across the street where his car was. He took off, running on foot. They tended to the woman and got her home safely. Turns out she lives across the highway from us, five houses to the left. It had been two hours later and they still hadn't found him. There are a lot of places to hide in these woods. I just hope he hides far away from here. I was a cashier at a busy grocery store, only a five minute walk from where my family lived. I knew several customers very well since I worked regular weekend shifts and lots of people came in at the same time each week. I always worked Sundays 3pm to 11pm. One Sunday afternoon was when I met this weird, creepy middle-aged man. He was with a woman and a young toddler the first time, so naturally, I thought they were a family. Nonetheless, I was my super friendly self. A lot of customers told me over the years that I always made them laugh or smile. Maybe this was confused as flirting, I don't know. So anyhow, this man, despite his wife or girlfriend being there, was overly friendly with me right away. I noticed pretty quickly that he wouldn't take his eyes off of me and held eye contact way too long. They left and I brushed it off. Then at night, at around 9pm when there was barely anyone in the store, he came alone when I was on break. I had another employee actually come upstairs to the break room telling me that a customer was asking for me, by name. I didn't think anything of it because sometimes my friends came by or a customer came back because there was a mistake on the receipt cashier's names were always listed on there. So of course, it's this guy, but nothing is wrong. He came down to the grocery store not to complain or buy anything else, but to tell me that he had a great interaction with me and that he sees great potential in my customer service skills and would like to go for coffee with him so that he can get to know me better, professionally of course. I politely declined and let him know that I was in high school and had other professional plans for university. He becomes really pushy, saying it's never a bad thing to get your foot in the door. Can he at least get my number for when I've finished university and looking for work? Keep in mind, I'm 16 at this point. Who even asks questions like that? I kept declining and he offered to drive me home. It was late. I said no, I live close by so I walk and he started asking, Oh, what street do you live on? I live close by too. At this point, I can see another employee from a distance starting to wonder what's going on, and I'm getting creeped out and annoyed. My break was interrupted because of this guy after all, so I just say no thank you over and over. 
Finally, he left, saying he'll be back next Sunday to see me because he sees great potential and won't let me go just like that. Red flags go off all over my head. I call my dad, tell him everything, ask him to pick me up, even though we live super close, like not even a two minute drive. Obviously, he says yes, worried about me. When my dad picks me up, I notice this guy in his car, in the parking lot, waiting, more than an hour since we spoke. I, stupid me, didn't mention it to my dad because I'm 16 and still in denial that this could be a serious situation. When we start driving, I notice that he is behind us, so finally I tell my dad. My dad drives straight and then circles around two different streets to see if anyone is following us, and yes, he is. My dad, being the European man that he is, gets out of the car to wreck this man, but the car speeds off. We wait a bit in the car as my dad debates calling the cops, but decides not to. When we get home, he parks the car in the garage. The story doesn't end there, though. My parents try to force me to quit my job or just stop working Sundays, but I'm like, nah, it's fine. Because, well, who knows? I was a stupid teenager. So nothing happens during my weekday shifts, and I basically forgot about it. But alas, the next Sunday night rolls around, and so does this idiot. This time, taking a photo of me with his phone. I kid you not. He took a photo of me as he approached my till, laughed it off, saying, I can't forget what you look like, right? I was seriously shook, but too nice to tell him off like I would had that happened now. I don't remember the whole encounter, but he kept pushing for me to sit down with him privately because he owns a business and needs people like me. I was so uncomfortable and scared, but tried to play it cool. My dad picked me up again that night. He wasn't in the parking lot this time. I stopped working Sundays. I gave my boss a description of the man. He came by one Sunday asking for me and was straight up told off by a supervisor, an older co-worker and friend, telling him to never come back or the store would pursue legal action. I didn't see him again and I went off to university. Now the follow-up. One weekend in my second year of university I went shopping with my mom and when we were sitting in the food court eating I felt someone staring at me and I saw him, sitting at a table maybe eight or so tables away, with that same woman and child and more people glaring at me. His eyes, his face, he looked like he wanted to eat my soul. I told my mom and we got up and left them all right away. I didn't look back. I haven't seen him since and I hope I never do. I know some people may say that maybe he meant well and really was just an eager businessman or something but there's nothing like the vibe of knowing that somebody just isn't right in the head. This happened around 2012, but I remember most of what happened clear as day. I worked with my girlfriend at a busy restaurant. We worked all the time, and it was a stressful job. We took off a few days and decided to fly somewhere to get away from work, people, and the town in general. I found decent deals and flights to Ocean City, Maryland for two nights. She had never been on a plane, we loved the beach, and I could hit up all the local crab cake spots. It was perfect. We flew into Baltimore and rented a car to drive to Ocean City. Nothing memorable happened the first day. We laid on the beach, hit up all the local shops, and had forgettable food. The second full day we woke up and went to the most recommended stop for crab cakes and on the way back we stopped and got crab cakes to go from two other recommended places for later. We stopped by the hotel to drop the food off and went to the hotel bar for a few drinks. Now my girlfriend at the time was a smoker and I hated it. She also would attract attention from guys which I would deal with but wasn't thrilled about. We go to the rooftop bar at the hotel, and the bar itself is a four-sided island in the middle of a patio. It's probably 2pm and a clear sunny day. We pull up chairs and there's only a few women on the left side of the bar and a guy bartender behind it. We got obligatory house margaritas. After her first drink, my girlfriend felt like she wanted to smoke, but the girls and the bartender didn't have one to bum her. We got refills and schmoozed with the bartender about the area and things to do, but mainly kept to ourselves. 
The bartender seemed as if though he was being fake. Something was off and I couldn't put my finger on it. A feeling of I really don't even want to run to the restroom and leave her here at the bar because I don't trust something. More than a few times he asked if we were staying at the hotel. I think I said no, the girlfriend said yes. He asked us what room at one point. The girlfriend went to use the restroom. A minute later I heard Guy's voice. I didn't realize that there was a group of three to four guys that sat at the table directly behind us. They were either playing cards or just smoking but they made some comment to her when she walked back. Great. We finished our drinks and were googling tropical drinks for her and area hotspots to check out. The guys came up on either side of us and talked to the bartender and got beers. You can tell they were either friends or regulars. I honestly couldn't tell you if they were there when we came to the bar or came after, but they had a sleazy vibe. Me and the girlfriend ended up talking to the only other couple at the bar that had come and sat down. It was nice to be away and just relax. We always liked making new friends. I didn't realize it, but one of the guys came up and either brushed against my girl or made a comment, and it rubbed her the wrong way. So in her infinite wisdom, she wanted to be bothersome to them and got up and asked to bum a smoke. I didn't realize it until I turned around, and there she was, talking to the guy with his shirt unbuttoned and gold chains hanging on his chest hair forest. I didn't want her associating with them, but if one gave her a smoke, I would get the guy a beer if it meant we didn't have to leave the bar to hit a store for smokes. She came back without a cigarette, mad. Apparently, the guys kept asking, what's in it for us, and said, your boyfriend wants to fight us, why would we give you anything? I didn't want to fight them. I was on vacation and I wasn't paying attention to them, but I didn't like the implication of the other comment at all. Because we had a lackluster first day, I wanted to pack in fun things this day, so this drink was my last one. I asked for the tab, and the guy of the couple we met gave us his business card and said we should meet him and his girlfriend at Secrets at 8pm. The guys behind us kind of swarmed on all sides of us and slammed down a pack of cigarettes, two smokes inside left, in between both me and the girlfriend. They said something like, Here and then ordered another round. We found it odd, but I thanked them and offered a shot. I don't even think they replied. One asked if we were vacationing, then asked if we were staying at the hotel, then took the round of beers back to the table. I had a weird feeling, as if they were locals and didn't like us because we were visitors. Turning back to the bar, my drinks were now completely full. Stupid me didn't even question it. I didn't want a refill, but figured the bartender taught me off. I took a sip, and the drink was strong. I just closed out, so maybe it was a thank you for the tip. It was disgustingly strong, like rubbing alcohol, maybe even turpentine. I told my girl to try it. Boozy Susie over here takes a huge pull from my drink and nearly spit it back out. It was gross. She made a face and said that it shouldn't taste like that. I couldn't even ask the bartender about it, he was gone. I don't know when he disappeared, but he was nowhere to be found. I can't remember if I fully finished the nasty thing. My girl said something along the lines of, The guys are staring, let's go. I was originally worried that she was going to chat them up and thank them before we left, but she said she felt weird. The whole vibe changed, she wanted out. I remember spending a minute or two saying goodbye to the couple we were going to meet later and heading towards the door into the hotel. The guys weren't at the table. Patio door, elevator, hotel room door, bed. My eyes open and I turn my head right. The alarm clock reads 3 a.m. I am face down in bed, on top of the covers. I push myself off, slide back off the bed and stand up. The sliding glass doors are wide open, as are the screen doors to the balcony. There's a breeze. I think, did girlfriend jump off the balcony? And in that millisecond, I hear crying behind me. My girlfriend is sitting Indian style on the floor with a clamshell of what was $40 worth of crab cakes in her lap, crying. She said she couldn't wake me up. She asked me if I remembered what happened. She said she had been sick and throwing up for four hours non-stop. What happened? I bent over and sit down with her and got hit with a wave of sickness. I ran and was in that bathroom for hours puking. 
By the time I came out, she was asleep and passed out again. This had to be a bad dream. I remember thinking that maybe we went to the club and got wasted and I blacked out. I went back to bed. We both woke up at 7am to our alarms. We had to take the rental to Baltimore and catch a flight back. We both had to be at work at 2 today. I was shaking. She looked terrible and we both felt like death. She was shook. She said the walk back to the hotel room was scary and she didn't remember anything after. Wait, what? According to her, when we walked into the hotel from the bar patio, one of the guys was on a chair near the elevators. He said something to us, but the doors closed quickly. She said when we got to the floor, two of the guys were at the end of the hall heading towards us. She said that we got into the room and they stood outside our door, and she thinks they knocked. Apparently, I laid on the bed and immediately was lights out. She couldn't wake me and passed out herself until she woke up to violently vomiting for hours. My body was shot, I was shaking, and now I'm processing that these scumbags maybe followed us to our room. Part of me thought she was exaggerating, but you know how you have a weird slow motion flashback. Well, as I was graying out on the way to the hotel room, I remember one of the guys being by the elevator. Also, as she was brushing her teeth, her mouth was blue. I went to the mirror, so was mine, neon blue. Nothing we had that day was blue. I had light green margaritas and vodka and root beers. This was proof that something fishy had happened. We didn't know what to do. We had to get back. We couldn't stick around. We got to the car. I barely felt okay to drive, but I wanted to be home. We felt dirty, we were confused, and we wanted out of Maryland and swore we were never coming back. We missed our flight, explained the situation to the desk, and somehow got put on another flight back home. We sat in the airport for hours, dying. The flight was painful too. We made it to work a few hours late that day. Nobody believed our story and thought we made it up to justify being late, and we kind of never brought it up again. I googled to see if similar situations happened and found nothing. We googled blue tongue and saw it's a side effect of a drug. I'll be honest, I felt lucky we made it out of Ocean City. I don't know if we were a target of a room invasion or robbery, or if they wanted to attack or kidnap my girl. It could have turned out ugly in a lot of different ways. What if my girlfriend didn't take a huge swig? What if I drank the whole thing by myself? How close did I come to an OD or death depending on the drug and its interactions with alcohol? I swear the bartender was in on it. I did call the hotel and asked if there was any issues with people being drugged or room robberies there and they said no, they have zero incidents and I think I let it go. I emailed the hotel from a throwaway email I created and told them to watch the hotel roof bar and bartender and never got a reply. I realized I wrote a ton but... That's my story, and I think about it any time someone brings up Ocean City. Back when I was 15, I picked up my younger brother from elementary school every day, and we would bus home together. We had to transfer two times, and this happened at the stop of the second transfer. One day I saw an old Caucasian man get onto the bus after us. He looked around 60 years old with white hair and he was really big. Since there was no seats available, I stood up to offer my seat for him. He gave me a smile and thanked me and I thought nothing of it. After a few minutes I noticed that he was still staring at me with a smile and at that time I thought he was just appreciating the fact that I gave up my seat for him. After another while, I was starting to get uncomfortable because I was noticing how intently he was looking at me. Once again, I tried to reason that maybe he had mental health issues or he was just slow because of his age. I took my brother by the hand and we moved towards the back of the bus. By the time our bus stop arrived, the bus was pretty empty. My brother and I exited and we started walking in the direction of our apartment. It was only a few feet away from the bus stop. I was pretty paranoid from earlier, so I turned around to check if anyone had followed us off the bus. I saw the old man walking in our direction, and I internally panicked. I reasoned to myself that maybe he lived in this area too, and it was just a coincidence that he was walking in this direction. So I kept walking towards the gate of the apartment. 
My brother and I got to the gate and I was digging in my backpack for my keys. Suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder and I looked up to see the old man smiling at me. I didn't know how to react so I just said hi and kept looking for my keys while I had my eyes on him. By that time, I was really creeped out because his stare was really intense. He said thanks for giving up your seat for me and asked if I was free to go for lunch with him so he could thank me. In my head, all I could think was that it was around 4pm so why would he want to go to lunch? I quickly declined, shoved my brother past the gate and slammed it behind me. The old man just kept smiling and staring as I looked back and I was glad that I was able to escape from him. A few days passed and I thought nothing more about the incident. Then one day, I saw him again at the bus stop. I tried to stand as far away as possible and try not to look in that direction. The bus stop was a busy one so there was always a line of people. I could feel him staring at me and I remember just wishing that the bus would come faster so I could get away. We got onto the bus and I could still see him smiling as he stared at me unblinkingly out of the corner of my eye. I tried to keep my attention on the book I was reading and not let it bother me. When our stop came, my brother and I quickly got off the bus and sped walk to the gate. I turned around to check if the old man had followed us off the bus and was immensely relieved that he didn't. I looked at the bus as it drove past and I remember seeing him by the window seat just staring at me. Then, for the next few weeks, he just kept showing up to the same bus stop. Sometimes I see him sitting by a ledge and... When he sees us, he gets in line for the bus. Sometimes he tries to go up to me and initiate conversation. I always ignored him the best I could and keep my brother on the opposite side of him with me in between. I was also immensely glad that I lived in an apartment so he didn't know where exactly we lived. I never told my parents about it and although I contemplated telling someone that was in line with me or calling the police, I never did because I thought that staring wasn't really a crime and he didn't do anything except try and initiate conversations. Plus, there wouldn't be any evidence. I also thought that because he was an old man, he couldn't do much harm, and maybe he was just lonely. I just tried to put up with it the best I could and stay as far away as possible from him. I also couldn't take another bus because the bus didn't come often, and we had to go to extracurricular activities afterwards. Then one day... He initiated conversation again and started telling me that he was a rich man. He showed me the gold chain around his neck and the gold rings around his fingers. I was mildly offended that he thought that this would make me talk to him. So my brother and I went into a nearby supermarket to try and avoid him and take the next bus. I thought that he would give up and just take the bus so I wouldn't see him when I went back. Except, he followed us into the supermarket. I walked through a few aisles to try and lose him. After I couldn't see him anymore, I decided to buy my brother a treat to calm him down. We headed back to the cashier's area and lined up. Then I felt a tap on my shoulder and saw the old man with a $20 bill in his hand. He offered to pay, and I said, no thank you. I think he said okay and just walked out. I didn't see him afterwards at the bus stop and thought that maybe he took the hint that I wasn't interested in anything to do with him. Luckily, this happened a month or two before summer break, so... I didn't have to take that bus route anymore. I also didn't have to go to extracurricular activities, so my brother and I took the bus at a different time. Fast forward a year, I was walking my brother to summer school every day during the summer. On that route, we walked past a subway stop. One day, we saw the old man at the subway stop. We quickly walked away, hoping that he didn't see us, but he must have seen us because every day after that, he was sitting outside the subway stop. He didn't try to initiate conversation, but he was always staring intensely at me from afar. I started getting nightmares of him kidnapping me or taking a knife to threaten me. After a week or so, my brother and I just took a different route to school. I didn't see him again until last year, so around six years after the initial time I met him. I saw him at the bus stop on my way to university and my heart automatically started beating faster and my hands became clammy. He must have saw me because he smiled and stared at me without blinking again. Luckily, since my classes aren't a set schedule, he wasn't able to lurk at the bus stop again waiting for me. I still see him on the rare occasion at bus stops around where I live, but for the sake of my sanity, old man, let's not meet again.
A few years back, when I was around 18 years old, my best friend Jesse at the time was dating and rooming with this guy named Corey. Corey had a twin brother named Tyler. They were both super nice and friendly guys. I would hang out over at Jesse's house quite often because she didn't drive and had a baby to take care of. A lot of the time I would babysit for her so she could work her two jobs. When Corey and Jesse started to date, Corey's twin brother needed a place to stay as well. There was enough room in the apartment for Tyler to stay at Jesse's apartment for a while until he was able to get back on his feet. So pretty much every time I was at Jesse's, the twins were there as well. Not too long after Tyler had arrived, Jesse made a joke stating how fun it would be for me to date Tyler since she was dating Corey. She thought it would be cool for the two best friends to date the twin brothers. At this time, I had a boyfriend and I wasn't interested in Tyler that way. I had just turned 18 and Tyler was 26 years old. I felt that he was too old for me at that point in time as well. I wasn't particularly happy with the boyfriend I had either and Jesse knew that as well. I was trying to make it work though. One day, Tyler was taking a shower when I arrived at Jesse's. Jesse and Corey were hungry and wanted to go grab some food for everyone. They left and I stayed behind just chilling in Jesse's room. Tyler had came in not too long after that that they left and sat on the bed with me. He was talking to me about random things, then all of a sudden, he just blurts out that he has strong feelings for me and that he is in love with me. I barely knew him, but I told him I was sorry and that I had a boyfriend which he already knew, but I felt I needed to remind him. He told me that he knows and he just wishes he had me instead and that he will just have to learn to get over it. So from there, I relaxed a bit about the situation. After all, you can't help who you are attracted to, and that's totally fine. A couple of months later, I was talking to Jesse on the phone, and Tyler was there with Jesse. She was again joking about me and Tyler dating, and I said he's too old for me anyway. It might be your thing, but not mine. I was trying to joke back with Jesse. I had to get off the phone, though, with Jesse after that point because I had things to do. Not too long after we hung up, she called me back. When I answered, she said Tyler just scared the living daylights out of her. I asked her what had happened. She said he got super angry at what I had said about him being too old for me and started flipping out and stormed out of the house. She thought he was going to do some damage. I couldn't believe that he was being so overdramatic like that. I told her that he's being ridiculous and he needs to get over it. It's just how I feel. He's a nice guy, but no thank you. I made that clear a while ago anyway. Jesse knew about that incident of him telling me he had strong feelings for me anyway. She probably shouldn't have kept joking about it, but again, she felt she was being harmless. After his breakdown at Jesse's, he did end up apologizing to her and to me for acting that way. We forgave him and told him he needs to work on his anger issues or he is going to scare people away, and he promised he would. A couple of more months later, Tyler started texting about how he can make me happy and that I should leave the guy I was with for him, that he would do everything for me and give me anything I wanted. I told him he needed to stop this because I had already told him I wasn't interested. He wouldn't stop though. He kept blowing up my phone with long paragraph messages about wanting me to be with him, the things he would buy me and do for me, and also talking really bad about my boyfriend at the time, which... He wasn't wrong about my boyfriend at the time. My boyfriend at that time was a horrible human being as well. I was getting sick of him blowing up my phone after I was repeatedly nice to him about the situation and tried my best to let him down easy, so I went to my boyfriend about it. As soon as I showed him the text, that created a whole other wildfire. He lost his mind and got angry with me, as if it was my fault. He ended up punching a hole in his bedroom door and fighting with me the whole car ride home. He said I brought this on myself because I didn't stop talking to Tyler. I was pretty upset that he was treating me that way and then I had Tyler blowing up my phone as well. It wasn't too much at once. I blocked Tyler from messaging me and calling me. That didn't stop him though. He would make Facebooks and message me on there. Super long paragraphs again. He started talking about marrying me and what ring would I like for him to buy. He wanted to get me all the gifts too and sometimes he would. He would get me gifts and have Jesse and Corey bring them to me when he was at work. I would constantly tell him to leave me alone and 
He would say that he would do that if that's what I wanted. I would tell him it was what I wanted and he would leave me alone for maybe a day, sometimes less. Then I would get another five paragraphs from him again. Every day this happened and it happened pretty much all day. I had stopped responding, hoping he would stop then, but he didn't. He kept sending the paragraphs and I honestly stopped reading them. I blocked him on Facebook and he would just make another one and message me. He kept up with that for a long time. I kept ignoring him though. Then one day was the last straw. I tried my best to be patient with him and to not take it to the police, but this was it. Tyler had messaged me again over Facebook. He said that my silence had given him the impression that I am playing hard to get and that he likes that. He said that he understands just what I am doing now, so since I won't talk to him, he is going to come to my house and give me what I want. He said if I didn't answer him back right now that he was going to come over and do things to me that I can't even imagine, and that I will really want him then. I didn't reply to those messages either, thinking he wasn't really going to drive to my house. He's just trying to get a response out of me and it's not happening. It was a scary message though, nonetheless. I had taken a nap at some point that day. There was a knock on my door, but I didn't answer it. My mom wasn't home, so if it was her, she would have had the key and came in. I just ignored the knock and went back to sleep. Then I heard my mom come in and call my name. I got up and went to her, and she said that I had a letter from someone. It was shoved under the door. She handed it to me, and it was a letter from Tyler. He did show up at my house. In the letter, he wrote some pretty disgusting things to me. He said he was angry that I didn't open the door and let him in. That he came all this way down here just to talk to me and this is how I treat him. That I'm selfish. He said he was going to take me out to pick out a wedding ring and now it's the last thing he ever wants to do. He said he hated me. He just went on and on in the letter expressing his anger with me. I immediately showed my mom and printed out the conversations from the Facebook messages my mother and I both went down to the police station and made a report and documentation. The police read and documented everything, but nothing super crazy had been done. I wondered what would have happened if I did open that door when he came to my house. I'm so glad I didn't. It didn't end there. A couple of days later, my mom had just arrived home. She said she saw a car parked out front of the house. The person in it was sleeping. It was a man. He ended up waking up and seeing my mom and he booked it out and she chased him down as far as she could, at least until she got his license plate information. We took it to the police to see if it was Tyler, and it was. He was sleeping outside my house in his car, stalking me, waiting for me to come outside. It seemed I always just missed him and it was like luck. It was strange, but I was thankful. Once that was taken to the police, an official court date was being made. He was taken to court for everything and I had to be there to watch. They never asked me to testify, but I was there to see what consequences one would get from this harassment. He got a slap on the wrist and was told never to talk to me again. He agreed with everything the judge said and went on his way. I was angry that was all he got, but he didn't do anything terrible, abuse me or worse, so that's all he was able to get. I thought I was finally rid of him though. I still stayed cautious of my surroundings. I had always carried my keys in between my knuckles and I had a taser as well. For a little while, I would have someone walk me to my car every time I left for work at night, just in case Tyler was lurking somewhere. He was a strong bodybuilder type, so I knew I would never have a chance against him. A few months go by, almost a year, and I get a comment on my separate business Facebook and follow page. It was Tyler. He was commenting super vulgar things on my page. One of the comments concerned my breasts. I immediately printed that out and went to the police. They couldn't believe he was back at it again, harassing me. I was so tired of this already. I felt like he would never go away. Again, we went to court and this time he was not allowed on social media for at least three years and he wasn't allowed to have any contact with me or anyone that is in contact with me. He also had to do community service, and he did get taken away in handcuffs. During the process of this second court meeting, he did admit to his lawyer, who told my lawyer, that he was obsessed with me and he didn't know why. My lawyer told me what he said, and I felt cold inside. I couldn't believe it to hear that actual word. Obsessed. 
That's exactly what it was too, and for him to actually say it too as if it's normal. Since that court date, I haven't heard from him or Corey or any of his family. I haven't seen them either. I have moved since that has happened and my Facebook is quite private. I am 25 next month and I am constantly still having to worry that he will find me one day, that he will make a Facebook and try to harass me again. I'm pregnant with my first child and I don't need that stress along with that. This happened years ago when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week and we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket was too expensive, and I had a 10-year-old Toyo there that might have been a bit beat up but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up, so they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every 2 or 3 hours and stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within the three-hour window, though, they would assume I had been in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audiobook and podcasts they knew that I have on. I accepted the deal. And that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 a.m. This was actually one of the nicer stops. Well lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them, the payphone wasn't broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple of cars there with people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I did check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Miss, can I ask you for a favor? I turned around and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked, but there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he was in his 40s. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was too close, but his body language didn't scream threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 feet, and at that point in my life 110 pounds soaking wet, and even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out-of-state license plate, my idiot self asked what he needs. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck and could he just borrow my phone real quick to call his friend. It would just take a second and it would really help him out. And I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him. And then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit and this guy looked really normal. Except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney actress in a Glade commercial who is trying to convince us she's in love with some idiot who doesn't know how air freshener works eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help, so I put up my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my god, I'm so sorry, but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone, and I need that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now, but good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet, and he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me, but now I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car because he creeped me out and he has a serial killer face so going to the bathroom is out, but I also wanted to get away from him, prove I'm not going to help and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get into the car, but I would have to get really close to him unless I crawled over my passenger's side seat, and he's not moving. So I did the first thing that popped in my mind. I called my dad, and my dad, for the first time that night, didn't pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He's still just staring at me. So I faked a conversation with my dad. 
I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had hung up the phone and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality, I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple visible security cameras. The guy still hadn't moved, and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I've thought of a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out and my mind went blank, so I hung up and didn't know what to do. I had hoped that the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little. At this point, he's been leaning against my car staring at me for at least ten minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men sleeping in their parked cars and asking for help, and just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me get into my own freaking car annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and headed back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car door before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call his friend to bring the spare keys. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he'd been creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. I almost pointed out to the working payphone just in case I was wrong about this and I was being mean to a guy who actually needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse, and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on, I was so focused on getting away from him. And then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom, who would freak out if I don't pick up and who was already sick, and I needed to put on my seatbelt. I could still see him in my mirror, he was standing right next to where I was parked with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again and to answer the phone, but I kept my engine running and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her everything is fine, where I am, my ETA. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I had overreacted. She scolds me about speeding and I tune her out because the guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck unlock the door and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seemed to be an issue for him. I watched the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes and when I did I didn't speed. I didn't want to see that truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with human trafficking and that girls who look like they don't live nearby or maybe look like they are living out of their cars tend to be targets. I don't know if that was what was happening, or if he was just trying to scare me into handing over my phone. I had just started working graveyard at the gas station close to my house. I believe it was my sixth shift altogether, but the fourth being by myself. It was just after 11 o'clock p.m. and this man came in. He's about 40 and had the dumbest haircut I had ever seen. Think botched bowl cut. Anyway, he asked me if I had changed for a hundred. I told him I'm sorry, but I wasn't allowed to take it, and even if I was, I didn't have the change. Side note, the company's third shift policy was we were not to take 50 or $100 bills, period. Well, he got upset and started complaining. He started trying to talk me into getting change from the safe. I apologized but again said that I couldn't. I tried my best to continue on to the elderly customer waiting behind him. He called out to his friend and asked if he had anything smaller. The kind lady I was waiting on asked me to hold her bag while she used the restroom. Bullcut's friend comes in and I immediately saw that he's on something. Now, I try not to judge people but... It was obvious. His face was covered in sores, kept touching at them, and he kept bouncing in places on his toes, like some kind of tweaker prize fighter. The friend starts asking me questions. 
Hey, sweetheart. How you doing? Are you always here by yourself? Do they let you have weapons behind that counter? And if so, do you carry one with you to work? I always carry a gun. How much money do they allow you to carry in the drawers? Do you still have to do safe drops even though uh, business was so slow? Each question that he asked made me slightly more uncomfortable. I'm kind of a mouthy woman and I don't always use my head before I speak. Finally, I interrupted him and was like, Look, do you plan to rob me? Because if you are, then you're wasting your time. I don't have time for this and I need to get back to work. His hands fly up and he starts sputtering. Whoa, 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 rob you? What? I was just trying to make conversation. What's wrong with you? I answered, well then your conversational skills could really use some work. You don't ask a woman working alone overnight those types of questions. So the real question is, what is wrong with you? I saw now that Bullcut had pulled the car horizontally across the parking spaces closest to the door. Upon seeing this, I was just beyond done at this point. I told him to leave the store and not ever come back during my shift or I would call the cops. He left. The poor woman who had gone to the bathroom had heard some of the exchange. She came up to me before leaving the store and asked if I was alright. I told her that I was and thanked her. Just a weird customer that gave me a weird feeling. He only came back once after that. I was in the cooler and could hear him yelling at the manager about not being allowed in the store. The manager told him he listened to the audio and would have done the same thing that I did. I know what some could possibly be thinking. I was over-defensive and dramatic. He was probably asking about the money because I couldn't exchange his friend's hundred. But, what about the other questions? He asked. Every great collaboration is a love story. It's intense, passionate. Along the way, there are flashes of love, hate, pride, ego, ambition, and brilliance. This is one plus one the show about the spark that drives two original thinkers to ultimate success. We'll unearth the stories of Paul McCartney and John Lennon, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, Beyonce and Jay-Z, Shaq and Kobe, and many more, and learn what it is about their chemistry that led them to greatness. Subscribe to One Plus One today at wondery.fm slash boom. It's January 1967 in London, England. John Lennon is sitting at the piano in his home in the suburbs, writing a new song. It's based on a newspaper account of a young socialite named Tara Brown, killed in a car crash. John comes up with something he thinks will work. But John's having trouble finishing the song. So he heads on over to Paul's house, just a few blocks from Abbey Road. Together, they finish John's verses and round out the tune by adding a fragment from one of Paul's, an old number he'd never managed to use. As soon as John hears Paul sing that couplet, he says, Yeah, that's it. This is how John and Paul write music, quickly, intuitively, finishing each other's ideas. Sometimes they have trouble remembering who wrote what. That's how closely they work together. But they're not done with this song yet. They want to make it wilder, more avant-garde. Abbey Road Studios, February 10th, 1967. And the Beatles, the most famous band in the world, are throwing a party. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are there. So is Marianne Faithful and Graham Nash. Oh, and a 40-piece orchestra, dressed in tuxedos, clown noses, and rubber bald caps. The bizarre attire is meant to loosen the buttoned-up, classically trained musicians, so they'll deliver what Paul wants. We'd like you to do some free-form improvisation. The orchestra is confused by the request. They want to please him. After all, he's Paul McCartney. But classical musicians don't really do free-form improvisation. Producer George Martin steps in. Okay, we don't want complete freeform. We want each individual musician to climb from lowest note to highest 
at his own pace. The orchestra nods. They try over and over to do what they're asked. John, dressed in a crushed velvet jacket and sipping wine from a teacup, watches from the sidelines. He wrote most of the song, but he's fine letting Paul coax the orchestra into performing what John calls an orgasm of sound. Paul tries to make John's concept come alive, urging the musicians to randomly play an ascending scale, growing louder until they climax on the same chord. On the eighth try, they finally nail it. Everyone knows they've just witnessed something special. As their songwriting grows more ambitious, John and Paul fall easily into these distinct roles. John, the conceptualizer, the big thinker. Paul, the arranger, the craftsman. I saw the photograph. On May 26, 1967, the five minute, 12 second A Day in the Life is released as the final track on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. The album's immediately hailed as a masterpiece. A half century later, Rolling Stone will still consider it the greatest album of all time. No one can guess where the Beatles will go next or that their partnership, which seems so strong, is already starting to crumble. From Wondery, I'm Rico Galliano. And I'm Faith Saley, and this is One Plus One. Imagine you have a dream, an ambition, but you always feel like you're missing something. A piece of the puzzle you just can't put your finger on. But then you meet someone, a collaborator, a kindred spirit, or even a rival. A person that dares you, maybe drives you to create something really inspiring. That chemistry of two people in a singular pursuit allows you to achieve the success and fame you never could have on your own. Together, you make a mark on the world. When you get right down to it, every collaboration is a love story with sparks when two great minds collaborate and compete. These kind of partnerships are what this series is all about. In upcoming episodes, we'll be sharing stories of power couples from technology and and sports and science, and you'll learn amazing things about them and their legacies. But today, the world of music. Indeed, some of the greatest collaborative pairs have been songwriters. Think of Rodgers and Hammerstein, George and Ira Gershwin. Somehow when it comes to crafting... Salt and Peppa. Salt and Peppa. We should do a Salt and Peppa series. When it comes to crafting the perfect three-minute pop song, it seems like two heads, a salt head and a pepper head, are often better than one. And of all these songwriting partnerships, I think we can say one team stands above the rest, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. In barely more than a decade together, they wrote hundreds of songs. And as of today, they sold over 600 million records. And we're talking 40 years after Lennon died. No question, the Beatles changed everything, and for a lot of people. The first song I ever loved was Yellow Submarine, although little did five-year-old me know it would go down between John and Paul like a year after they wrote that little number. In fact, from when they met in Liverpool to when they conquered the pop world, I can tell you there was more than a little drama. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you can tell us, because you're going to tell us about it for the next six episodes. That's so right. take it away, Rico. The story of Lennon and McCartney. Thank you, Faith. This is episode one, Eyeball to Eyeball. Fall 1962, 24th Lynn Road in Liverpool. Paul and John sit across from each other in the cramped front room of Paul's house, guitars cradled in their laps. John's wearing his Buddy Holly horned rimmed glasses. Paul's propped one foot up on the base of the coal-burning fireplace. They're hunched over a grammar school notebook containing the lyrics of a song Paul's been working on called 17. He's having trouble with the first verse. She was just 17. She'd never been a beauty queen. And we kind of looked at each other like, I said, I don't really like that line. They run through words that rhyme with queen 
until John comes up with an alternative. You know what I mean? That's better. Suggestive, maybe a little sexy, but vague. It draws the listener in. They jot down the new lyric and run through the song again. Eventually, they'll give it a better title, too. I saw her standing there. They work together like this for years. John calls it eyeball to eyeball. The left-handed Paul says facing the right-handed John feels like looking into a mirror. By 1962, they've already written dozens of songs this way, including a few future hits. They call their band The Beatles, a nod to one of their favorite singers, Buddy Holly, and his band The Crickets. Never one to resist a pun, John changes one of the E's to an A. He wants to emphasize they've got the beat. But what's really going to make the Beatles stand out from scores of local bands performing covers are the songs John and Paul are writing. For now, the Beatles remain local favorites in Liverpool, but unknown everywhere else. Well, almost everywhere else. In the summer of 1960, a Liverpool promoter is shipping local bands to Hamburg, Germany. Rock and roll has caught fire over there, and there's huge demand for bands that can sing Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry covers in good English. One of the groups this promoter wants to send abroad is Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, featuring a talented drummer named Ringo Starr. That was just a preview of One Plus One. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on Pandora, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.